So we're here this evening. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce this evening's speaker, Sherry Kreider. Sherry is here tonight as an artist curator from our spring exhibition, Other Targets, which is just downstairs in our main gallery. Other Targets is a group exhibition and multimedia installation by the artist Sherry Kreider, uh, Janae Sanchez, uh, Gabriela Munoz, and Shaptina Vernon. And this uh, special exhibition is open until March 29th. So if you had, did not get a chance to see it today, please come back and um, check it out. And uh, open until March 29th again. Uh, Sherry Crater describes herself as a queer visual artist and civil rights dreamer. After multiple years of addiction and incarceration, she attended the U of A School of Art on a fine arts scholarship and later attended the University of New Mexico where she earned her MFA in ceramics. A crafter, tinker, and certified contractor, Sherry founded a contemporary arts gallery in Albuquerque called the Sanitary Tortilla Factory. Her gallery has become a platform for artists and the community. The curatorial practices and programming of, of, of her gallery intentionally undermine structural inequities both in the art world and the community. Sherry Kreider is dedicated to works at the intersection of experience, empathy, and equity. She is, um, in 2018, she uh, was awarded a National Endowment for the Arts of Our Town Grant for Social Justice Project. Uh, in 2017, was awarded a right of return, um, United States of America uh, Award for a Formerly Incarcerated Artist, which is a fellowship. Uh, and in 2016, was awarded the Fulcrum Andy Warhol um, Award from the Andy Warhol Foundation. Uh, so I'm absolutely delighted to uh, bring up Sherry Kreider. Please join me in welcome. Okay, hopefully. Hi, everybody. Thank you for. It's not too loud. No? We're good. Okay. okay. Um, well, thank you for coming. And um, it's such an honor. Don't touch that. <laughs> it's such an honor to uh, have an exhibition here and be able to speak here. It's um, one of those moments where it's this full circle that. Um, you can't even really put words to it. Um, so, and um, one of my former former faculty members and instrumental instructors are Marsha Bose here in the front. And uh, it's just, you know, and, and my story and about my artistic practice is a little different than some stories, I, I would think. Um, so, uh, and I, uh, when I uh, came up with the, you know, what I wanted to talk about in the talk, I picked this phrase, and this phrase uh, is uh, used in improv, and one of my dear friends that does a lot of cultural organizing uses it when talking about best practices in arts, in politics, like it's, and I found, I've incorporated it into my life. Like it's a much better way to have a conversation. And um, so, let's see where we are. So we were going to do a little bit of improv, just to kind of like really, uh, you know, embrace this yes and concept. So. Anyone, I'm going to point to someone because I know nobody's going to volunteer. Um, so the way the yes and works, and they use this in business too, which I think is, is, in, um, is very strange. Um, so the world is full of people, so I'm going to say the statement and I'm going to point to someone and you're going to say yes and. Okay? So the world is full of people. Yes, and it's also full of boxes of frozen waffles. Yes, and you? It's also full of a lot of contradictions. The thing that I love most about this statement is that it really embraces contradiction and a lot of different versions of truth. And I think that the things that I make and that my artistic practice has been a place where to sort out my, um, my existence, you know, in the backdrop of being a small child and reading a storybook about this is how life is. We have children, we grow 
grow up and we have a job and we just live this happily ever life, you know, until you're older and find out there's a lot of uh, inconsistencies in the story. Um, so, as Chelsea said, I attended the University of Arizona on an academic tuition waiver, fine arts scholarship, and was arrested numerous times in Arizona for prostitution, fraud, and theft. Um, and that really, so that's where I came to this university, was on, you know, from a very different place than many of the students uh, that I shared classes with. And I remember, I was in the honors program, and I remember very distinctly sitting in a criminology class. <laughs> and, like, the conversations about what makes people criminals, et cetera, was, was this silo conversation about who are these people. And it was very evident that most of the people in those classrooms had no idea who those people were. Um, and so I've always been able to, I don't know whether it's a blessing or a curse, but I, I view things from a very different lens. And um, my artistic practice really helps me sort those things out. Um, and really kind of it, when I look back now, um, this movie, so I really wonder, uh, I went to this movie, you know, not when it was first released, probably five years afterwards, you know, so I was attending the university here, and I remember going to this movie and having this moment that I had no idea that the civil rights struggle was within my lifetime, you know, and, and I was, and I'm still very interested in how schools can suppress all of that history, you know, and, and tell this story that doesn't exactly represent the truth. And so, you know, my, um, and I read a lot, of, and it's so interesting, like all of the people that I used to read um, in queer theory classes here are still resonating. People are still pointing to Audre Lorde, James Baldwin, Adrian Rich, Bell Hooks, you know, and um, they're just, uh, I, and I really like, you know, this idea of truth being more of, you know, it's, it's nothing that we can really put our finger on like this is the truth. It's a lot more complex than that. So we do not need to master or conquer the narrative as a whole that we may know in fragments. And so I think that many of the things that I make are about those fragments of truth. And this is me graduating in 1996. And um, just really, you know, I met with a lot of graduate students today and it was so interesting how everyone is really um, kind of deconstructing their family history. Like, it was so interesting to see that in so many of the artists that I met with today, but that's, you know, it's, it's part of people's practice. And mine is, you know, I was adopted, and there were all of these different truths. I was told all these different stories about who my family was. And um, just a few months ago, I got did one of those Ancestry.com things. And, um, you know, all, so many stories. Like, I could spend, um, so when I was here um, making art, um, I was very much into kind of uh, deconstructing my lived experience um, and the public experience, attaching my unusual experience with public corners and spaces. Um, I don't take, it's funny, I don't talk a lot about the things I make. So this is, uh, this is the most recent thing of, uh, on the right is a letter that I received describing who my biological parents were, um, that my father's a truck driver who's already married, and this whole thing. And I met my mother in 1995, my biological mother, and she told me 
this story about who my father was, which I thought that's who he was, but indeed it wasn't. <laughs> Via this uh, uh, Ancestry.com, Mike Pantos is my half-brother, and um, this was just a few months ago that I received this kind of startling information, and he is one of three children. They've been married for 63 years, so I'm a product of, of fair and um, and none of that family kind of wants to deal with the truth. So, so right when I was um, ruminating about what I was going to talk about, and I painted the one painting downstairs, you know, can we start with the truth? It was just kind of this moment of we we're doing uh, the impeachment hearings were going on. Like there's just so no truth to be found anywhere, um, which is very disturbing. Um, So, uh, in all of the work downstairs, I am really starting to become obsessed about history and how we seem to be recreating, like everything's new, like, uh, you know, Scott Warren, this is like a new problem, and many of us know um, so it's this present tenseness of whatever political theater is happening at the moment. And um, in all of the pieces, there is this kind of look back to history in, um, in a conversation. Um, so and w when I first started uh, thinking about this exhibition, and I had done two proposals, the other proposal was about the environment and environmental work. And um, one of the things that I was shocked to find when I was like, you know, I've lived in the Southwest for a very long time, was the lack of water. And, you know, it's always kind of been a thing. But I had no idea that water conservation, like this conversation in environmentalists were, you know, wanted us to conserve water. and. Um, I had found, all right, you guys might find this video a little entertaining. This is an early water conservation video. So there, you know, and, I mean, maybe I think a lot while I'm making things, and um, so, you know, I'm just really um, surprised that all these environmental movements, civil rights struggles, all of these things, people have been working and struggling with these issues forever. And, um, you know, how, how does it all feel so new? You know, like the Scott Warren thing. Um, this is a 1986 New York Times article about John Fife, which if people that are from here, John Fife was kind of the godfather of the sanctuary movement in 1986. Mm -hmm. And the same sorts of criminal charges he was facing in 1986. And um, I think that we, uh, have such a short memory, or, or maybe we're just exhausted of, you know, trying to um, create social change. Um, 
So the piece downstairs, the video piece, um, has this newspaper clipping. And I just wonder, you know, I, a lot of my work are, uh, kind of creates scenarios where I can kind of hypothesize what might have made us more empathetic or how could we transform culture. And um, so the video, you know, and they all, all go to the trouble of making it and then realize that, you know, it's kind of a lost cause. Um, and um, so how I, uh, a, a lot of people have asked me how I kind of like became um, interested in, in talking and, and looking at immigration and um, right when I received that fellowship for, uh, what was it, the, the fellowship funded artists to create works that were attached to criminal justice reform. And so when I'm living in New Mexico, there was a lot of things happening with uh, this detention center, which is about a 40 minute drive from um, Albuquerque. And thinking about being incarcerated, you know, it's kind of like the most dehumanizing experience a person can have. But then add an additional uh, layer of not knowing a language, not knowing where you live. I just can't even imagine that experience. And having, you know, you, when you're incarcerated, you feel like you don't have any rights anyways. But then being, like I can't imagine that situation being worse, and it is worse for people from another country. They don't have any resources. And, um, and then this specific, uh, the Cipolla Detention Center is, uh, it's the only transgender uh, pod in the country. So they're shipping transgender people from West Africa, like when you look at the people that are detained at this facility, it's just, I can't even put words to it because, um, you know, and I always think of, of these environments, like everything, all the racism, all the uh, prejudice and bias that exists in culture in these institutions is even like, it's on steroids, like. So I just really, uh, and, and the, the other thing that, you know, so I just, I make a lot of work about this thing, and I'm just like, how, does, how do these things keep happening? And, you know, uh, most of my work, most of the stuff downstairs starts tracing the money. And um, people are profiting a lot off of, all of these kind of terrible things that are happening. Um, and um, so I'm making that work, and then I, uh, I really enjoy, you know, you can only make art by yourself in isolation for so long until you really have to like talk to other people. And um, so I do a lot of work uh, that's community engaged and uh, so these women are at a, it's a parole program called Crossroads for Women. And so I worked with them as a part of this project. And that facility that's now the transgender, you know, pod for the nation was once a women's prison. And so all of these women have, most of these women have been in that prison, but they have no idea that it's part of this larger, you know, story about mass incarceration and um, so we made uh, this was an exhibition at the University of Arizona and we made lots of birds and you know there was a metaphor about flight and um, so that was kind of like my feel about my work um, and how I curated this exhibition um, was that the things that were really important to me is to have uh, 
intergenerational and um, intersectional conversation about being other. And what made sense regionally, um, so Jenea, Jenea was uh, in an exhibition that I curated at my space, and she lives in um, Douglas, and this is a video that she had, it's Ring Around the Rosie, so they're doing, you know, and this is pre, now it's all kind of hip and trendy for everybody to be like making seesaws on the border, and you know, she's been doing this kind of work for a while now, and um, so she, and, and the portraits, so this, the large portraits of the women um, were in my gallery, but they were really small, so I could really, the power of that work was amazing, and um, so she was a perfect person to um, include in this exhibition, and so these, that's Janae in the middle, and um, the one portrait downstairs next to my plate piece is Trini. So this is Trini, and this woman's in one of the portraits, and this woman. And um, in December, I went down to the Douglas Creative Works community uh, organization, and it's just, so like, you know, I, I enjoy making art, but in the end, like, it's about the people. And um, these women are doing amazing things, you know, with very little resources. And that was another really important tenet for me. Like, a lot of the things that I do uh, in Albuquerque is, it's really, I place a lot of emphasis on things being, happening in the real world like having real impact instead of just being artworks in the institution. So that's Trini, the woman that had her hair up. And so I really hate talking about my work, but I'm, I'm, I'm better at like answering questions about my work. Um, <coughs> So I think, I kind of like tore through that, but uh, this, is a, this is a quote that I take uh, kind of with me and every time I talk, I think it's really important we're at this moment where everybody's really ready to tear apart everybody. Like, you're either too left or too right and um, you know, really trying to find that common ground. This is a quote, it was in uh, Nation Magazine, and there was a uh, big pushback about all of the stars at the Academy Awards who spoke up about Me Too. And you know, a lot of people on the left were just tearing these women apart, that they had no right, they didn't know, um, and you know, we need all of those platforms, I believe everyone to find some sort of common space and voice and those kind of phrases like yes and are like such an important bridge to creating coalitions that actually change culture. Um, so, I'm not going to read it. You guys can read it. Um, and then, <laughs> this is, and I just, uh, this is a, a young woman who's going to have a show uh, at my space in the spring. And, you know, just when I was like, you know, when you just feel like you can't do anything else, you know. I did a studio visit with her and we were organizing for her exhibition. She handed me that and I'm like, okay, it's a message, keep going. <laughs> um, does anybody have any questions? Did I just blow through that like in like 10 minutes? I think my friend's saying yes. <laughs> Tell us about some of the individual pieces in the show downstairs. For instance, the um, Monopoly houses with the, with the call station. 
Well, so, and, and actually, those things are kind of separate. Uh, well, I, I think of them as individual pieces. The sculpture in the front is modeled after a rescue beacon. So these things are throughout the desert. Um, and you see them in the desert. There's a graphic where you push the button and people are supposed to come help you. Um, and there's a, some conversation about like if that's a, a, a valid means of rescue. Um, and um, so this piece kind of riffs on that. Um, and, and I think of about I think about it in this way that it leads to incarceration. So what happens when these people, yes, they may get some water, but they're going to be detained without, you know, without any legal recourse, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's just all over. And, um, and then there's a motion sensor on it that plays uh, four section, four songs, parts of songs, that for me represent um, civil rights struggles throughout the decades. There's Woody Guthrie's This Land Is Your Land, uh, Nina Simone, uh, Billie Holiday, and then A Tribe Called Quest, and you know, um, and it emits lavender. So and that, the title of that piece is called Non-Tactical Monument for Reparations, you know, and, and um, the documents on the other side of the clipboard are the death reports for people that have died while being detained. And you know, if, if well, if you want to feel worse about immigration, you should go to the ICE uh, website. It's absolutely horrifying. There are like pages and pages and pages and pages of documents that um, you know, I don't even know what the word, kind of mandate this policing and dehumanization of people seeking resources. Um, and the mon so the monopoly piece is very much related to uh, the video game that's on the other end of the, of the gallery. And, um, I'm very interested in how games that we play kind of socialize us in a way of, that supports capitalism and, um, you know, kind of the status quo, how we're practicing from a very young age about how to, you know, when you look at monopoly and the development gentrification kind of conversation, we're taught very young to just the games, you know, the, um, you get out of jail free, you know, like, you know, there are all these things that are really disingenuous to, like, how the world really works. I wanted to ask about how you got hooked up to do this show. Now, I mean, I know you you went to school here, and <clears throat> well, I think it was um, some of the people here saw on Facebook. I had had a show where I did some sculpture uh, at the museum in Santa Fe, and um, just they reached out to me, and so then I submitted two different proposals. Um, and it was like a long time ago. There was a different director. I had a conversation with that director. And um, early on, I was going to do this environmental work. And between then and you know when we were organizing for this exhibition, I had received that fellowship. And my work had taken a dramatic turn in a different direction. Maybe it connects to the 
space you run into? Well, I've always been enamored by artists' abilities to speak to different parts of issues. Um, and I think, uh, you know, some of it is just purely subjective, arbitrary judgment, like I like this kind of work kind of thing. Um, but I think it's a really, like I specifically really love bringing the work in from the collection too. Like how you can create sort of a, a chorus and a conversation between different artists and, and a conversation with art history. Um, yeah, it is a lot. It is a lot different. There's a lot more responsibility <laughs> involved with it. Like, you know, bringing different artists to the table and, uh, but, uh, but then I'm really, wanted Janaya Janaya to have autonomy as to how those works were manifested in the gallery and really honor their visions of, of what that work looks like and what they think is important in the conversation. And I think it really being a curator and an artist is that yes and kind of implementation of um, creating interesting conversations that aren't just, you know, a solo show kind of thing. So you mentioned that the first proposal was one direction and then you worked in another direction from the fellowship. So where are you going now? The dreaded question was next. Where am I going now? That is, well, um, I have a roar to thank for this because uh, I made that ceramic piece kind of like, you know, I'd gotten a, my emphasis was ceramics and I remembered how much I loved that material and in making the piece downstairs, I really see um, I'm making another plate piece, uh, you know, that kind of merges um, the piece I'm working on right now is uh, kind of like a conversation of Maslow's hierarchy of needs and uh, capitalism, how those things interface with each other via sculptural plates that hang on the wall. So I'm making that, and I'm, um, I have a very large um, <clears throat> public art project that uh, will be realized this summer in Albuquerque. So when you guys I have Albuquerque people that I ran into in the coffee shop this morning in the cave, which is awesome. <laughs> Ask for canyons, stick together. Um, but so I'm doing a, a project where uh, it'll be at the airport, but I'm working with a coalition of artists. Um, we're re-envisioning a 1950s Albuquerque postcard that says, Welcome to Albuquerque. And so all of the letters are filled with these very beautiful places in Albuquerque that don't really represent Albuquerque. And so what we'll be doing, uh, there'll be four youth artists, two system impacted, and two just talented high school artists. And we're gonna work as a coalition with three other professional artists to re-envision those uh, images that inhabit Albuquerque. And, you know, we'll be talking a lot about history and how histories are suppressed. Um, and we have two Native American artists. Like, so we really, like, uh, I'm very excited about that. I have no idea, like, how, you know, the practical ends of how that's all going to work, but so I'm doing that and um, just taking the next, you know, I think it's a difficult process to be an artist. It's like, you know, making stuff. So the, the, uh, the public art, art project, is that going to be primarily like painting on something? 
Yeah, it's going to be more, it's going to be a uh, value panel, which is what billboards are made out of. It would be very kind of slick, um, but we're also the other thing that that I'm integrating in it is that I really want the kids involved to have professional experiences as an artist. So um, hopefully, fingers crossed, we'll be doing a, a lithograph at Tamarind um, that will be on the inside of the museum to, that points to the content on the big piece outside. Um, so you won't be able, you know, driving by it, you won't know that that's the Pueblo Revolt, you know, in the L or, you know. But on the inside, there'll be a suite of lithographs or some sort of smaller scale that points to all the content. We have a small sketch of that. Yeah, the, on my website, there's a, well, yeah, if you go to sanitarytortillafactory.org, there's a call for the student artist on there, and there's an image of it. Okay. Yeah. And that's the other thing that I do and love so much is um, I've been running an art space for the last 12 years. <laughs> um, and that grew out of, you know, so when I was at U of A, I got here based on that I drew really well and a counselor drove me here and said, you could go to school here, and then I became an artist, you know. And, um, so when I went to graduate school, I realized that the audience of art was pretty small, and um, I really wanted to create a space that um, was a platform for community and artists that we could kind of have, um, you know, it could be a much more interesting place. And so we have, if you're ever in Albuquerque, and it's in a historic restaurant that people have loved forever. Um, Toby? This is, this is a strange question, but when you're doing art, it's a very personal thing. But then how do you, how do you produce something to, to make it relevant or to make an impact on what we're all experiencing today with division, the people at the border, environmental things. How do you, how does your art um, deliver a message to a, a, to a particular group of people? I'm just trying to, how do you get the word out there that there's something wrong? <laughs> you know, like, well, I think if you don't know something's wrong, you've been in a very curated space. Uh, but I think a lot of people are. Yeah, well, and it has a lot to do with privilege and, and their life experience. Um, I don't know how to, you know, when I was meeting with graduate students, I think that as an artist and someone who's offering something that is very personal to be in the public space, you have to uh, decide who your audience is. You know, and your aesthetics decides who's a part of that conversation. I prefer to reside on a space that is more open to different audiences than abstract painting or, you know, something that is directly related to art history. Um, so I strategically um, make things that people will understand as an object, you know. Um, I, I, do this, I do this other body of work too. I've still been painting these stadiums. Um, and I, you know, at the venues it's been at, I love that like all of the staff members know what that is, you know? And, and, it, and so having that um, availability and recognition that you can have a different conversation than you know, these 50 people over here have an art degree or something. I'm curious more about um, the place that you have in Albuquerque. Um, what other sort of things do you have going on there? Like, do you have like a workshop space? Do you, do you have like open workshops? Like, 
Thank you all so much for being here. Thank you so much for sharing. 